I thank God for His church. I thank God for the servants of God in our church, both in America and Cambodia, men and women who serve the Lord. And I thank God, especially for Pastor David this morning, for leading the church in this church service and in prayers. I am very, very blessed and very humbled to receive all that blessing. Greater joy and blessing and deeper in my humble heart is to serve the Lord, to represent His mouthpiece, to preach His word, and especially the topic of today. My title is The Holy Spirit and the Gospel. And we continue in the book of Acts chapter 8, which we covered for the last few weeks. And the portion that I had promised that I will come back to talk about it, and I acknowledge, disclaimer here, that I am nobody to even preach the word of God, let alone handle a very difficult topic such as today's topic. This is what we, excuse me one second, let me, everything's slow, electronic. That's why I love old school technology open and read and you don't need electricity and Wi-Fi but anyway take it as it is now the topic that we postponed for a little bit and now we are back to to this passage which is verses 14 to 17 this is dealing with the Holy Spirit and it can be very controversial, but I'm not here to try to debate with anyone. I'll try to prove that I know something more than anybody is nothing new under the sun, and especially at my level. So I humbly come to the Lord all this months and weeks long, and today especially, in His sight, in His holy race, holy place, the church of God, the body of Christ, to ask him to give us grace, give me grace to handle this topic. Help us with not only human ability, I try my best, but help us to handle this difficult topic by his grace and by his power, by the Holy Spirit himself, and by the pure text and context of the passage of the Holy Scripture, Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. We postponed it for a reason because I wanted to go through the whole movement of the evangelism, the Great Commission, the dispersion, and the great, not tribulation, there was persecution of the church the first person who died serving the Lord was Stephen. And then later on, we saw the church spread all the way to Samaria and, in a sense, to the end of the earth. So the Ethiopian came to Jerusalem and get in contact with a brother, Philip. So there was a wonderful account that we did not want to break. Oh, I didn't want to break. It was a blessing to study, to learn the history of the church, to learn how the Lord worked in, in dealing with, with obstacle and turn it to be something wonderful and spread the gospel and use all the servants of God and the children of God, the church of God, to do God's work. There's a lot of application, which is a blessing to all of us. We are blessed by that especially the brothers and sisters in Cambodia in which we minister to because they live in a condition a lot harder than the condition of the United States, the modern developed country. So we had a good, good, blessed time study, studying Acts chapter 7 and, and 8. But we came across this passage regarding the Holy Spirit laying of a hand to 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 ask the Holy Spirit to 
to baptize them and to to receive the Holy Spirit. And I didn't want to lightly touch them. In itself is a topic of of important topic of itself and which deserve a full attention. Even one sermon alone for this topic is not even enough. And I recognize, I notice that, and I, I know that. A lot of scholars and great servants of the Lord and Antarctic and scholar and faithful men of God, both past and present, or, or contemporary time, many men that I love dearly and respect dearly talk about this and plenty of documents and, and information that we you can go and read and study on your own. It would be a good thing to do. I advise you to do that. But as for us, for me, for our church, I see this would be good enough. Not to put it lightly that I say good enough is not that sense. But for our mission to move forward, I trust the Lord that this is good, that we devote one sermon to this topic or this passage. Would somebody mute our um, some noise, please? Thank you. I appreciate that. Now let me read this passage in your hearing. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. Now when the apostle at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of, the, of God, they sent them Peter and John. They sent the apostle Apostle Peter and Apostle John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. See, that is something very difficult. Not super difficult, but not that easy. And a lot of time people take that one line, one, one point here, to build a, a whole life doctrine and even a, a, a movement that's very, very dangerous to do things out of contact. We have to understand the, 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 the contact and the original intent of this writing, the history, the writer, the audience, the recipient, and the time of the growth of the church, the birth of the church of the first century, the apostolic time, church. So it's very difficult. And we have to look at the whole picture of the doctrine of the Christianity, of the Bible itself, and the Holy Spirit, and salvation, and the Great Commission, in the church. We have to look at everything. That is why it's not a small topic. But let us continue. For he had not yet he referred to the Holy Spirit, had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, people ask, what more? You know, they believe, they, they believe in the word, they believe and they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, but they have not received the Holy Spirit. Then they laid, their hand on them, the apostle Peter and John, laid their hands on them, the Samaritan who believed in the name of our Lord Jesus and who were baptized, and they received the Holy Spirit. And that is very, very important note here. They received the Holy Spirit. I'm sure all of you and me, myself, agree that it shouldn't be a problem because they receive the Holy Spirit. They, they have the Holy Spirit too. What's the problem? The problem people said that, well, they have the wait. And I'd put, I would push further and say, what's wrong with waiting? Well, it's not fair. It's what is fair. Did the church or did God owe the Samaritan anything or any one of us for that matter? 
See, the mentality of an instant noodle, an instant Holy Spirit, an instant power like Simon is very dangerous. It's very dangerous. The big picture is they receive the Holy Spirit. The big picture is there is the order, structure. The big picture is who we have to see who we are. Let's say, let's be fair about all of this. Put ourselves in here. We are the Samaritan. We are the pagan. We are the idol and magician worshiper, idol worshiper, pagan to the core. And we big on superstitious. And we big on pride and big on arrogant spirit that we can do this and do that better than people. Just in itself, the book of Acts, chapter 8, talk about Simon the magician. And how dangerous it is. The apostles say, you and your silver and your gold, your money that want to buy the power of God, want to buy the Holy Spirit, pairs together. See how serious it is. So for that reason, it should be no problem. We have to understand who we are. Do we deserve anything at all, first of all? And look at our habit, our nature, our background, our practice, our culture, our life all along. Isn't that dangerous for us to just jump in into something and drag a bag of paganism, superstitiousism, maybe I made up word, to into, into church and to into the church of God and then slap the name of God, confuses the Holy Spirit and go around and cast out demon. It's very difficult and go out to the world and heal people, promise healing and promise cast out demon in the name of Jesus and give them the gospel and give them false hope and all of that. It's a mess. So this is me. Nobody, <laughs> me mean nobody here. Someone is nobody. And very small, small brain and small IQ uh, and knowledge and all of that. And I look at this, I feel very, very concerned. But maybe because I don't have much up here, that's why I'm very concerned. But leave it as what it is. But look at this. Why God, why the Holy Spirit didn't come, why the church in Jerusalem and the apostle have to, had to come to pray and lay their hand on for them to receive the Holy Spirit? Does it seem a bit second class in the church? Let us move forward. Let us think. Let us depend on the grace of God to understand this. Let us depend on the word of God to understand this. Not only here, but the whole context of this passage and the context of the New Testament and Old Testament and the context of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit as we study all along in the past and always. Above all, let us depend on the Holy Spirit himself and that is, you know, anybody can claim that, but does that mean was a real reality that we are depending on the Holy Spirit? Or are we just saying that and we whip around and do our thing and say our thing? I sincerely mean this. I sincerely mean I am humbly and, uh, and joyful and, and, and appreciate this opportunity to, 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 to preach, to touch on, touch base, to be honest on this topic. And I pray to God for you and me that we we we, we receive from him as as Pastor David pray that we we learn from the Lord and let it not be cross a line for me or anybody to say we learn from the Lord and all of a sudden um, a man a, a mortal a sinful man and it just barely got saved by the grace of God and came in and teach are we learning from the Lord or learn from the man you know and that is very very comforting and very 
scary, very frightening concept and thought that, that a man, a mortal man, a sinful man and an uneducated and very, very lowly man to come to to be the mouthpiece, mouthpiece of God. And that's a serious, serious reminder to all of us, to myself. So sincerely, I, I make the point, I say many times, and I will say forever throughout eternity, that I'm not qualified. Hey, I don't deserve it. Would huh? you um, mute that, please? What about you? Working on it, hold on. Thank you. Just be readily mute. It's hard to find. Thank you. I, I, I know, I know. Okay, just do your best. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. I am not dragging the introduction of the sermon today, but there's a very, very strong note here before we go in. And after this, um, I'll try my best under the grace of God to present this topic to you from the bottom of my heart and more than my ability. I'm depending on the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The Holy Spirit himself and the Word of, the word of God itself. And as I mentioned earlier, people can say that, oh, let the Holy Spirit lead and really mean it or really actually happening. How do I know that my saying that the Holy Spirit lead is really the Holy Spirit lead? I am confident to say that the Holy Spirit lead because in my heart is I confess to you that I do not want to depend on what I understand, let alone what I don't understand. But reality, not reality, that's a reality in me, but to confirm that, to verify that, for you, how would you know? It's in my heart, my soul, my mind, inside of me. But what you and I can verify that what I present and what it's quote unquote tangible, you know, not like you touch, but it's physical aspect that you and I can verify by seeing, by hearing, by touching. So I'm bringing the Holy Scripture, cross references from here and there related to the Holy Spirit and the arrival of the Holy Spirit and the, the, uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, in the believer, to lay it on this topic and to work through together that you and I know that this is from the scripture and this is from the Holy Spirit. And again, people may say, oh, you, I just pick and choose a passage to support my point. I have two answers to that. Number one, why not? <laughs> why not? Number one. Number two, if there is any other topics, I mean, in a, any other passage that doesn't support my point or my belief here. And I humbly stand corrected. I do want to be corrected. I do want to be right in in this topic, in the Lord, in Scripture. Doesn't matter what topic it is. This is a sincerely honest plea to God and to the brothers and sisters. I, I hold no pride in and, and and saying that I am I'm correct all the time. Absolutely not. So this is something that we all grow together. We all learn together. And I may grow um, in a better understanding and come back and say, you know, I confess I was wrong. And I'm okay with that. And I like to be that way. I don't want to be the perfect one, the God one. <laughs> no. No, no, no. So this is what you can, you and I can see and enjoy together. But above all, let us enjoy what we all receive in our heart by the Holy Spirit, by God's grace, in the Word of God as we study, we read together, we study together, we separately, individually, and then let us rejoice 
in the word, rejoice in the spirit, rejoice in the Lord together. And let us be humble to grow as we are growing daily. Back to the Holy Spirit and dwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is not just anybody. This is Apostle Paul who pinned this down in the, one of the, well, all the Bible, every books of the Bible are important, but in for this topic, very important. The book of Romans, the book of Roman, Romans, that was Cambodian. Yeah, book of Romans, chapter eight, verse nine. Romans eight, nine. Yeah, I realize sometimes probably often, I probably say something in Cambodian because there's some word, a proper noun, like, like, like a place and person like that, and Cambodian language and other language and English, very similar. And I realized I said that I probably said that too often. I didn't realize. The Book of Romans, chapter eight, verse nine. Apostle Paul said that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, dwells in you, in us, Christian. This is later time that the gospel, the Church of God, spread all the way to, to Italy, to Rome. So this is more than just the time that of the Samaritan who received the Holy Spirit or became Christian in the book of Acts. So now the apostles talk about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit stay dwells in the believer. It's a known fact. And he went further to say that anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. It's the same Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the Trinity. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? Yes, it is. The Spirit of God dwells in you. The Spirit of Christ dwells in you. The Spirit, Holy Spirit dwells in you. The same thing, therefore, make them the triune God. Make Christ equal to God. That's another whole topic in itself. I would love to come back to talk about that, about this portion more in the future. That's something not just personal interest, uh, but it is an important point, important doctrine to talk about the Holy Trinity, the divinity, the divine nature of Christ, and the person of the Holy Spirit. It's not a bad thing to do for personal and for the church. Then again, this is not to debate or to fight, to argue with anyone, it is for to honor the triune God. Paul said, anyone does not have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of our Lord Christ, the Spirit of our God, does not belong to him. Reverse that. That means the Holy Spirit in us, we belong to him. We Christian, we obviously have the Holy Spirit. So all of us have the Holy Spirit. That will post a but a concern to some, and they have to come up with their doctrine, solution for their doctrine, so they have to come up with something strange. Why? How strange that they say, well, then we're all supposed to have the Holy Spirit, otherwise we're not, we may be saved, we may be baptized, but we don't glide or come up to the second level, a higher level, to receive the Holy Spirit, yet, Therefore, we need that. So we pray for the Holy Spirit. Oh, we have to have someone lay their hands on us to receive the Holy Spirit. And there come with two solutions. They say, well, then now we'll do it. I have a lot of Holy Spirit in me. I can share some. After all, I, I can speak in tongue. Tongue means gibberish tongue, not different language. And somebody understand legible language It's not that. They talk about a different type of speaking in tongue, the pagan one, the one that Apostle Paul forbidden to do because it's not Christian. And they, they, they claim they can handle snake and the snake bite them and they die. They cannot handle snake anymore. 
and then they said they can cast out demons and this and that, and nobody can verify. And they said, okay, then I can go and lay hands on people, and and, and they receive the Holy Spirit. Just um, just come uh, whip up some conference and uh, sell a ticket and a lot of offering and this and that. And uh, whoa, it sounds like um, Simon the Sorcerer to me. With all respect, I'm not putting anybody down, but I'm talking about it's serious to damage the name of the Church of God, the, the, the Holy Spirit, and the Bible, Christianity. It's a shame. It's, it's just like the sense of selling the Holy Spirit, sense of, I apologize to say this, but to me, I have to confess, it's feel like fake. I feel like making up stuff. And again, with all respect, I'm not looking down on anyone, but I'm talking about the action, <clears throat> the action. And worse than that, I heard this is with my own physical ears. It's not imagination here. They said then um, uh, it has to be the apostle. Apostle, the one only, or the people who can lay down. Lay down, lay the hand for a believer to receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm glad, I'm comfortable that you say that because only the apostle. But wait a minute, they said, don't worry. Our church has a couple of apostles. I said, oh, really? No kidding. Is that Peter, John, James, and all one of those 12? They said, no, no, none of them. Oh, okay, okay, because they wouldn't be living for the last um, 2,000 years, right? No, we have a new modern apostle. Oh, boy. Apostle Smith? Apostle this? Apostle that? Oh, never mind then. I run the other way. Before those apostles, quote, unquote, lay their hands on me. Don't touch me. Don't give me your holy, holy spirit, holy spirit. So that is a problem here. And poor, poor elderly people fork out the the saving, life saving money devoted to those ministry. And when they run out of money, when they need food, they need shelter, they need medicine and they don't have any and none of those apostles quote unquote none of those ministry go and help them that's very that's the effect of bad doctrine and i'm very very sad a hey, just smear the name of god b hurt a lot of people simple-minded people Anyway, for us, as for us, as for me, I humbly serve the Lord and don't claim to know that I'm, to, to claim that I, I know better than anybody. I'm just asking God to help me to do what honoring Him, what's true, what honoring the church. I'm not asking anything out. I'm not saying I'm not asking for much. That's a lot. But but that's important to all of us, to me, because we will be judged more strictly when we are sitting in a chair in a position of, of, of teacher, or pastor, or preacher, handling the Word of God, representing, representing God Himself, the mouthpiece of God. It's very serious. <clears throat> So we know this doctrine that God, the Holy Spirit of God, the whole, this Holy Spirit dwells in us because we belong to Him. This is doctrine of the Holy, this is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in a believer. But whether it is the reason why the Samaritan had to wait for the Apostle, it could be understood by other means. Let's look at directly what the role of the Holy Spirit 
our role to receive the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and believers. And, and more than that, more than this, it's not about us, the Holy Spirit, whether we receive the Holy Spirit, whether we can perform magic or miracle or this and that. It's not that. It's important, more importantly, more important than this is the Holy Spirit and the Great Commission, the Gospel, which bring honor to God honor to Christ's blood, death on a cross, honor to Christ's resurrection. That's more important. The Holy Spirit and the Great Commission, the Holy Spirit and the salvation of the lost soul. That's more important. More obedient, pleasing to God is to obey God, not have knowledge. So let's continue. Because God in the According to our Lord Jesus, from his own lips, the Apostle John recorded in John 3, you know, everybody somewhat, somehow, sometime in Christian faith know John 3, for sure. You, If you read something, you read the book of John, you get to chapter 3, and three, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. All of us know that uh, that verse. And if you stop, you stop at John chapter 3. I hope you did not. So, no, I didn't stop at John chapter 3. I went all, all the way to John 4. <laughs> okay, that's better. But John 3, 334. <clears throat> this is what our Lord Jesus said, that God gives the Spirit of God to believer without measure. For he whom God sent, Jesus, God sent, utters the words of God. For he gives the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, without measure. The point here, God does not spend the Holy Spirit a little bit of a time. A little bit of a Holy Spirit toe, little toe, big toe, and then foot, and little pinky, and the little hand, fingers, and... and uh, and, and, and later on, you earn more, you plead for more, God give you more Holy Spirit, and then later on, give half the Holy Spirit. It sounds weird. The Holy Spirit is a person, the third person in the, the, the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. You cannot do that. God give the Holy Spirit without measure. Mean abundantly, completely, fully. To show that God's kindness, God's grace, God's generosity, but also to show that the Holy Spirit is a person. More than just God being generous is the more respect to the person of the Holy Spirit. Is a whole person. But again, this is about the Holy Spirit and the Gospel or the Great Commission. As we study the book of Acts chapter 8, this is not just the book of Acts chapter 8, the 7, the chapter 1, 8 chapters now. But since we land at chapter 8, and that since we land on the contact in chapter 8, let us look at review back from chapter, from verse 1 down to all the way to the end, but we pick and choose the topic, the point that support our topic today. We see that the church was um, under the great persecution, you know, by the Jews, the religious Jew, Saul, approved of this execution, meaning executed of the brother um, Stephen. Now the church were in serious trouble because of the religious Jew, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. There's a point here. And then they scattered throughout the land, the region of Judea and Samaria. Opposition, persecution, trouble times, but only in the eyes of human, but in God's eye, it's a perfect plan. Although God is not evil, God does not condone evil, but God can turn everything 
for his glory, number one, for his purpose and for his glory and purpose and mission and the benefit split to two, to the church of God to fulfill the great honor commission. The church got to obey God. God said he pleased with obedience then sacrifice and burnt offering. This is no better illustration than this. This sacrifice is suffering. It's turned to be obedient which God pleased which God is blessing. This is in the will of God. God caused all things both good and bad, good and evil, for good for all those who love God, for all those who have chosen. So this is a perfect, perfect example. This is the work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the gospel, and the work of Again, split into two, the benefit to the church, the church get to complete, not complete, the church get to exercise, to exercise, to be in the privilege to fulfill the Great Commission. And I said split into two points here. Point number two, the benefit for the, for the sinners, for the pagan Jews and pagans alike. Gentiles, I mean, to receive the gospel, to receive salvation, to receive the Holy Spirit himself. See, this is what is happening. It's deeper than how come the, the Samaritan received the Holy Spirit later than the Jews, later than the apostle. Well, number one, what's wrong with that? Was not fair. What fair is it then? Uh, you talk about fair, they should not, and none of us should not receive the Holy Spirit, the gospel, and salvation because God didn't owe us anything. We owe God. We offend God. We owe God to pay for our sin, ourselves, in hell forever. That's that's what fair is. That's you talk about fair. This not just more than. Fair, God is fair enough to pay for our sin. God fair enough to have our sin removed by paying for. And God, beside being fair, not more than fair, he is, he is not that fair beneath this. Fair is fair, just is just. God, beside being fair, being just, being holy, he does everything perfect and holy and right. And beside that, coexist along with that, God is a perfect love. He is very loving. And that's why we receive His grace, because He's loving, gracious, and merciful. And that is why we receive Christ. We receive the gospel. We receive salvation. We receive the Holy Spirit. And with this, we see this in this account that the church scattered all over the world now to Samir, Samaria. And then you see that in verse 4, as they scatter, they went about preaching the word instead. And verse 5, Philip went to Samaria, Samaria, the city of Samaria, and proclaimed to the Samaritan the Christ. And they were all believe, listen to him. Many were baptized, and there was a physical healing performing by the brother Phillips. And there were sick people were healed. But the conclusion is this portion is verse 8. So there was much joy in the city. There was much joy in the city. This is a blessing flow from Jerusalem to Judea and to Samaria. And as we continue to see that it didn't stop at Samaria, but look at Samaria a little bit more. 
verse 12. They believe Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. See that? There's no complaint here. But we saw an individual by the name of Simon the sorcerer, the magician, and he too joined this movement. But we saw verse 14 to 17 earlier. I'm going to read it one more time. And when the apostle at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they went to them. I mean, they sent, sorry, I, they sent them, Peter and John. Who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for they had not yet, for the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only believed, only been baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen to that. They had received the Holy Spirit. But the greater focus point here is that the Holy Spirit and the gospel continue to <clears throat> to honor God and the blessed poor soul lost soul and the <clears throat> now the Holy Spirit the scripture focus on the greater point. The apostle preach to re preach repentance, preach salvation, preach forgiveness, and continue to preach. Verse twenty five. And they, <clears throat> and when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, and were all on the way back, all the way back, and on the way back to. Back home, they were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. See, this is the movement of the Holy Spirit, the act of the apostle, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And verse 26, 27, 28, 29, and we saw that the... the the account of the, the Holy Spirit led Philip, the one of the seven, Stephen's fellow servant serving at the church. The seven men were chosen to handle the table and distribute food to the poor. Preaching and performing, continue to preach and con continue to heal people. And now, Zero into one individual, an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of Ethiopian, who was in charge of all her treasure, the royal treasure here. He came to Jerusalem to worship God. And now God arranged this predestined, prearranged, scheduled it to be together, him and Philip. To receive the gospel, to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. As we saw that. But this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 26. An angel of the Lord. Again, this angel of the Lord told Philip. And then the message. This is signified the heavenly message, the divine message message from the throne of God. Talk about this is God's mission. Not so much of, um, focus on the angel of the Lord here yet. Let's talk about the introduction of the divine mission from heaven. God inspired message. God inspires command for Philip to do the bet to do to do the command of God. And later on, as we see that scripture reveal the messenger from the Lord here, continue to talk to Philip 
or take over either or. But the point is the Spirit of God spoke to Philip to go, rise and go, rise and go, go over, go to do this. Verse 29 now, 26, the, an angel of the Lord now, just an angel of the Lord, not the, an angel of the Lord, just to signify the Lord, the message, the inspired mission. And in indefinite article and here, it's to point out the Lord, the inspired mission instead. But here, verse 29, the Spirit said to Philip again, the same grammatical structure here, go over. Get up and go, go over to join this chariot. And as Philip went and so on, the result is verse 35. This is the heart of this passage. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture. The scripture was, uh, um, we studied that last week, um, Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8. Starting with that, where the Holy Spirit led both Philip and the eunuch to join together from the prophecy of the suffering Messiah. From the scripture, from that point, he told him, Philip told the eunuch, the good news, the gospels about Jesus. Can't get better than that opportunity to turn this moment to preach the gospel to preach christ this is the inspired mission god inspired mission from heaven carried by an, a, a servant a messenger of god and now continue to lead philip by for sure, we can say this in verse 29 that the Holy Spirit is speaking and leading the Holy, the 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 mission, and the the the, the servant of God and the hearer about Jesus through good news about Jesus, and the result is he baptized him in verse 38, 39, 38. He baptized Philip baptized the unit, and then. It didn't stop there, verse 39 and 40. Continue to wrap it up to show that the work of the Holy Spirit regarding preaching the gospel by using Philip. When they came out from the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip. You see, the main character more and more revealed as the scene open, curtain open more and more to the next scene, the next scene. This is the work of the triune God. The work of God himself, the Holy Spirit, about his son, Jesus. That the Holy Spirit is the main character here, obviously from beginning to ending of this episode of the Philips um, giving the gospel in encounter, encounter with um, the eunuch, now is closing with the Holy Spirit himself by carrying Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more, saw him no more. But that's not the main point here. The main point, he went on his way rejoicing. This is a result of the receiving, receiving the gospel in Jesus and the Holy Spirit himself. In verse 40, this is subtle, but still the power in the work of the Holy Spirit. But Philip found himself at Azotus as he passed through, preached the gospel, focused on preaching the gospel again to all the towns until he came to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea. The same as the apostle preached to many villages of the Samaritan. This is carrying on the mission and power and ordain and superintendent under the the superintendent works uh, under the power under the controlling under the supervision work of the Holy Spirit, and that's a beautiful testimony 
of the work of the Holy Spirit, of the work of the Holy Spirit guiding and leading the church, the servant of God, and the wonderful result to the audience, the recipient, receive the gospel, receive salvation, receive Jesus Christ, receive the Holy Spirit, receive the relationship with the church, receive the honor and relationship with the church and with God. But now come back to us. Even stronger, Jesus himself said this in the book of Acts as well, the, at, at the very beginning of the book of Acts. So let's turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He said that you will receive power. Receive power. What kind of power? This is not small power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, the Holy Spirit come from God, from heaven. This power is from heaven. Empower the church. Empower believers as they receive the Holy Spirit. Empower, of course, the early church, the apostle. Yes, but the apostle in the early church, the doctrine, continued to carry on throughout the world by giving the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the triune God, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that Jesus and God had taught them, had commanded them to carry on the legacy, the baton, the doctrine, the salvation, the gospel the church of God. And it's not something to stop there. Have you saw that? The Holy Spirit dwells in each believers because we belong to God. God doesn't give us the Holy Spirit by measurement, by dispensing little at a time. So, Jesus said that from that point, from the apostle, from the early church, from the apostle church, from the Jerusalem church, that they received power in the Holy Spirit. And to do what? This is the equation. When they receive the Holy Spirit and they receive the power, they will be Jesus' own witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So this is the formula and the equation that received the Holy Spirit and received the power and give the gospel to all people and teach them to do the same. And now we do the same. We are commanded by, mandated by heaven, by God, by Christ, by the Great Commission, by God inspired mission and message to carry the Great Commission forward. Therefore, we must do. Therefore, we receive the power from God, and the Holy Spirit from God, and the gospel from God, from the church, from the Holy Scripture, from the Holy Bible, to do the same. So, we all have the Holy Spirit. We all have the power of God. We all have the gospel. And we all have the Great Commission. That is the big picture. And when Christ said this in verse 8 of chapter 1, it's fulfilling now. Now I'm talking about when Philip talked to the Ethiopian, because the Ethiopian was not Samaritan. He came from Ethiopia, which means now it's a represent of the end of the earth. Not that Ethiopia is the end of the earth, but it is. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. And now, our present time, in this century, the gospel, the mission, and the prophecy and the command of Christ is being fulfilled, that we are the benefit of receiving the gospel, who we, we are pagan, Gentile, and born and raised, and so happen to be at the end of the earth and receive Christ as well. And we receive the Great Commission as well. So this is a wonderful prophecy fulfilled. 
and is no other than the power of God, no other than the Holy Spirit, and the power of God empower this great commission to live on. And there's needless to say, if we don't have the power from God, we don't have the Holy Spirit from God, we don't have the gospel, what are we going to do? Make up our own fake doctrine, quasi gospel, say the name of Jesus, and this and that, and the result is weird. It's away from the context of the Holy Spirit, which is to focus on Christ, to focus on the glory and honor of Christ and the triune God, the Holy Father and the Holy Spirit, who condemns sin, who punishes sins on a cross, who, who bless us, with this payment of sin in Jesus blood and bless us with uh, of, 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 of payment of sin and Jesus completion work of the, the the cross which is proven in resurrection and this is the main point of the whole Holy Spirit and the gospel and Jesus and the triune God and the mission of the church not so much of the petty question is that do I have the Holy Spirit? What do we do to have the Holy Spirit? Or oh, we pray for the Holy Spirit so we can speak in 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 a weird way and to impress people nobody understands and to, to handle snake and and to perform miracle and the nobody say uh, uh, walk on water and try that you 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 shame the Holy Spirit and then and um. To raise the dead, I heard people say, "Oh, I tell you, Pastor, I'm uh, this is a real story, raising the dead. but no document, and that is a word of mouth." But this is true. I said, uh, "I like that. Let's let's borrow the brother and go to hospital and go to uh, the cemetery. I was going to say seminary, or maybe both." But anyway, borrow the apostle and to go around and do this, especially the last couple of years that we go through that pandemic. And why don't we just go around and cast out COVID-19? Oh boy. Anyway. It's not the point here. The point here is to honor God, to do his best, to fulfill the Great Commission, to bless soul with salvation, with Christ, the blessed soul to join the church, to bring honor to God, to glorify God, join the hallelujah chorus in heaven. But why Jews, why the Samaritans had to wait then? Like I mentioned, and then again, this is my own speculation, my own little limited information and knowledge and ability, I believe that God has to contain, control that otherwise that out of control. Can you imagine land a, bre a car, a two tons machine that can go 80 miles per hour, can plow through things into the hand of some arrogant teenager who's careless and, and, and worry about nothing? But prize and and speed and fast and furious. Can you imagine that? These Americans are totally pagan and idol worship and 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 and, and my magician. Can you imagine now they have the Holy Spirit without proper <clears throat> proper doctrine, proper teaching? Is a problem here? However, there's a more, more sure, in a more sure word. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, talk about the gospel and talk about <clears throat> the, the ring that God designed. And this also show not only God intelligent, it's also show that two things, that the sovereignty of God, number one, number two, the holiness of God in keeping his covenant and promise. We're going to wrap up here, run to real quick. So put on your seatbelt. Maybe more than seatbelt. Put on your parachute. Maybe buy a life insurance because we're going to go fast here. 
Just kidding. Romans 1.16. This, this is regarding the gospel, preaching the gospel. Paul said the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone. The gospel is the power of God for salvation, to give us salvation, to redeem us from our sin for everyone, for everyone who believes. God loves the world. God gave his son. God gave salvation and grace to everyone in the world who believes. And that is a mission. That is a main point. That is a gospel. That is the, the, the heart and, and love of God toward us. However, however, the last phrase here, to the Jew first. To the Jew first. You say, ha-ha, see? That's prejudice. What prejudice? Did God owe anyone, the Gentile, us anything? Again and again, I said many times. If we talk about owing, <laughs> we owe God. We owe God our sin, our punishment. We need to pay for our sin in hell. We owe God that one. God owe us if we talk about in a negative sin. God owe nobody nothing. <laughs> yeah, if God owe us something, He owe us in heaven in, in hell. He need to send us to hell. Except, what well, then? God beneath us if He owe us something. Let's see. When we get into psychological, philosophical argument, we trap ourselves in stupidity. But the doctrine, the Bible, and God Himself, is a lot more intelligent and a lot more powerful to solve all that problem. God is a holy God. God is a just God. God is a fair God. God is a judge, and God obey what is right because it's in His nature. Not that He's inferior to that, but it's in His nature. He act accordingly. So He hates sin. Because he hates him, so he punishes him. He punishes him to an extreme. Our sin paid for in the blood of Christ. Talk about fairness. Fair done. But beside being fair, God is being loving, being gracious, being kind, being holy, loving, and God watch saving us for paying for our sin through for paying for our sin. He sacrificed his only begotten Son. Jesus sacrificed his life, but his resurrection gave us continue to complete our salvation in salvation. That's what God is doing. So, if God give his salvation to anyone he pleases, is up to him. He's a master, he's the owner, he's a sovereign God. We deserve nothing. Reminder. Jews or Gentiles alike, but now that he decided to give to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, it's perfectly fine. I don't mind to be to to be second to Jew to receive salvation, then arrogantly the first to go to hell. I don't mind to be the last or second or last to receive salvation to receive Christ. Again, I said the same thing twice. Then the first to go to hell. You want to be first? Want to be fair? First and fair are our condition, our nature, and our attitude is to go to hell. That's fair. And first, immediately, intently, permanently, eternally. But God didn't do that. The gospel is the power of God to save us from hell, from hell. Any one of us who believes believe in Jesus, but the Jew first, and then the Gentile. Why? Number one, as I mentioned, God is sovereign. He decides to do things perfectly. His way is higher than our way. His thinking is higher thinking as heaven, higher than earth. So is. His nature, his thinking, his plan, his action. Who are we to even compare with God? It's not even in a bracket. 
a totally different category. And we come with the mentality of, of, of uh, you know, pride that we equal, we can argue with God, and we're in big trouble. We should come to him in humility, total depravity, but based on his grace and his blood alone and his divine nature, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Alone, alone, otherwise, we would have gone to hell. And we, <laughs> with attitude of arguing with God and, and trying to square with God, be fair with God, we deserve punishment. And of course, some of us may be totally ignorant, and inform and now we heard now we know if we truly genuinely saved by God our hearts convicted and we repent not to say that I'm arguing to say you uh, be quiet you cannot argue anymore you cannot read no it's not it's just reason continue to argue and reason in the right way in a humble way and truthful and loving and submissive and in a pure way against our ignorance instead not against the Holy Spirit against the Holy Scripture against God reason this reason this if anything good at all in us is of God everything bad in our life is us reason that and keep that in mind it's nothing of God that causes us to be bad or anything to be bad it's us human people complain to God why God allowed this to happen why God did this why God, God didn't do anything of that we started it since the beginning of the creation beginning of the human race and continue until today, even now and forever, leave us to ourselves. We damn ourselves to hell. So Jew first and then Gentile. Number one, God's sovereignty. Number two, God is a perfect holy God who keep his word, keep his covenant. God cannot lie. God, God cannot lie. God cannot break his word. And the Holy Scripture as well cannot be broken. They mean God's word cannot be broken. God's promise cannot be broken. <clears throat> Said, oh, God weak and bound by his own words. Not God is weak. It, on the contrary, God is so powerful that he and his words are equal, and he and his plan is equal. He is so powerful to keep his word and keep his plan instead. The mentality to twist it to say God is so weak, he, he submit to a rule, he submit to his own word, he submit to his own plan. That means he's not totally sovereign. No, actually, he is so totally sovereign. That's why he create all that he and his word, his rule, his plan is work together perfectly in his will, in his good pleasure, in his good nature. So it's a mentality of, of, of who we are, the equal mentality, the, the, um, the sovereign, human sovereign mentality, the, the democracy in a wrong way. You know, it's just like we're all up to vote. You know, who are we to sit in a judge, in a, in a, in a judgment seat to judge God and his action and his word? That alone is ludicrous. That alone is crazy. That alone is dark and sinful and, and crazy. Yeah, I said that already. It is crazy to the highest degree. If we come up to a position and a mentality and, and a feeling that we can we can judge God and his word and his action, and we I can't even imagine anybody say that, but we do this all the time. We say that we are God. We are greater than God, not only God, we are greater than the God of the Bible, the God of the universe. That is absolutely scary for anyone to say, to think, to even imply that. That is Luciferic spirit. That is Lucifer. That is satanic. That's Satan. Anyway, back 
I know that's a different topic in itself. Back to God keep his promise. Back to God keep his covenant. God make a covenant. Remember God in Genesis chapter in the Genesis. And this is the account God and Abraham. God told Abraham in Genesis 22. Read Genesis 22. It's beautiful. It's a good season. It's, uh, right now, especially in this season, just read all of that. It's just beautiful, wonderful, and powerful. Bless your soul, your mind. Bless your, your not only spiritual aspect, but also physical aspect, your physical mind as well. But anyway, God told Abraham, God tells Abraham, say Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, to go to the land of Maria, Moriah, and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Whoa! That is the ultimate test. I preach on this before. I love this passage. I love this account. I love this part of the Bible so much. Anyway, that's feeling personal. But um, the point I want to make here, Abraham did everything God said, except when he about to plunge a knife. I know a thing or two about plunging knife to a flesh <laughs> because <laughs> I had some accident with knife. I know how it is knife getting to a flesh. I say this with um, uh, smiling and grinning because that was not good. It's painful. Can be fatal. If you plunge a knife into a heart of a person, which Abraham about to do, wholeheartedly and hope that God can raise his son from the dead and that he not that he didn't love his son he loved his son whom he loved the only son Isaac but he loved and respect and obey God more than life his son is more than his own life Abraham's life is nothing he's about uh, around a hundred souls a hundred and, and so years now his life is in his son Isaac but now he's about to sacrifice his life and God told him the angel of the Lord said verse 11 verse 10 then Abraham reached out his hand and took a knife to slaughter his son to end his son's life but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said Abraham Abraham and he said here I am he said do not lay your hand on the lad on the boy or do anything to him for now I know that you fear God seeing you have not without your son, your only son, from me. Oh, there's a lot of beautiful context and aspect and points in this. Just few phrases alone about the triune God, about salvation, about predestination, about sacrificial act, about obedience, about love, about Easter. Everything about the gospel. And then this come, verse 15. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I sworn. By myself I sworn. Oh, an angel of the Lord sworn by himself. Declare the Lord. How beautiful it is. Ain't this an angel of the Lord say this, I sworn by myself, declare the Lord. Declare the yod heh right here. The Almighty God. Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offering, I'm sorry, your offspring, then offering too, of course. 
as Abraham grew to be a great nation, great man and wealthy man and strong man. God bless all of that. Anyway, multiply your offsprings <clears throat> as the stars of heaven, as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Listen to verse 18. And in your offspring shall all nation of the earth be blessed. The term offspring here, we will study in depth again. It's a wonderful, wonderful word here and doctrine. Your offspring shall be, shall all the nation, the Gentile, all the nation of the earth, not all the nation talk about everybody in Jewish and the, the Israel and Judea, Jewish uh, nation, the nations, just plural, and of the earth. Let's talk about the gospel. Your offspring shall, in, in your offspring, shall all the end of the earth, all nation of the earth, be blessed. Be blessed. It's a prophecy. It's a prophecy. It's the design plan of God. Because you have obeyed my voice. Wonderful. This is a promise of God. This is a plan of God. It's a covenant of God and God later on, as we studied last week. We not really study the whole thing, but we touch base a little bit on, on this passage, Genesis chapter 15, as God took Abraham and show him the vision, show him the promise, and Abraham questioned God because he's childless, he had no offspring, and so on. His wife's a barren woman, and they're both old. And as I mentioned, this passage, this chapter is a beautiful, powerful passage as well because the triune gods is that word. The term in verse 1 and verse 4, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. Well, the word of God came to, of course, Abraham. Verse 1 and verse 4, the word of the Lord came to. This is not just simple God said to Abraham. No, this signifies something important. It's a person, the Word of God. In the beginning, it was the Word, the Word with, with, was with God, the Word was God. This is only two times in the whole book of Genesis that has this phrase, the Word of the Lord came to him as he is a person, not a thing, not a phrase, not a concept, not an as, um, abstract message, not just a sound. The word of the Lord came to Abraham twice here and talk about the promise. And Abraham continued to, to not necessarily be disrespectful or, or challenge or he was weak. You and I, uh, Abraham's a father of faith. Abraham was count righteous because he believed. Verse 6. But Abraham is a human still. He had a lot of questions and so on. And God could have just said, Abraham, you talk too much. You argue. You dis the disagree with me. You, you disrespect me. You don't trust me. <laughs> could have been a, a, a bad ending here. But God is so kind, so gracious, so powerful. Above all, God is a God who holds his word. He said this. Abraham said this first. Oh, Lord God, how am I to know that your promise is real? Am I going to possess all of this? Yeah, after all, God has done all of this thing. I'm not faulting Abraham. I probably, I'm not probably, I would I, I would have done worse. But anyway, God said, verse 9, I'm going to read 9 to 12. God said, this is a review again, bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, and a ram, three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. 
and he brought them and he brought God and he brought him all these cut them in half and laid each half against over against the other but he didn't cut the bird and verse 12 and behold dreadful and great darkness fell upon him that moment he was drowsy he was falling to deep sleep it's not because he's weak or lazy the sun is coming down and this is a moment of intent intent moment of great dreadful darkness fell upon upon him as he could not hold his mind his physical cognitive and spirit up right now he's went into a real deep sleep this means he's out Abraham out poor man he's like a hundred years old now imagine I'm impressed that he's gone that far to get all this animal and 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 maybe he has some worker helpers whatnot but to do all of this in the heat of the day and the the dog to gloom me and talk to God I would be so exhausted I probably dead by then but Abraham just holding up to to this point verse 17 but the point here in verse 18 verse 17 when the Sun had gone down it was dark this is very very much reminding of the Twilight Zone and the zone that where the Passover lamb is being crucified I mean not crucified, being um, slaughter being sacrificed yes and also the darkness remind me of the three hours over the cross when Christ was hanging blood to death it's just beautiful I know in itself is not beautiful but it's a beautiful funny to say beautiful love of God on human race but it's not too beautiful in God's sight, in God's eye, regarding his own beloved son die. He who knew no sin and became sin for us and took our punishment. He took the punishment to execution. He took the whip and the cross so we can live, we can be healed and live and be free from sin. And that alone, if we do not get it or don't receive it or don't appreciate it, don't worship God, don't love God, don't love the Son, we shall be anathema. This is very powerful and emotional and very strong, one of the most one one of the one one of the most heavy doctrines of the Bible that God died for sinner that's darkness and the wrath of God the judgment of God on his own son but anyway let's come back here when the sun had gone down and it was great it was dark behold a smoking fire and a flaming torch passed between these pieces carcass that animal that chopped into half and we know that we learned this many times over and over it's a powerful beautiful um, um image here talk about the the agreement of an official agreement official um contract that two are sworn to death together to not break the promise to not break the contracts otherwise it would be dead like those animals bloody dead gore and smell and dirty and and and, and stinky throughout this half hot afternoon and just imagine all the flies and the stench that came out from this this is a serious moment this is a holy god walking with the father of faith abraham but abraham 
without a commission. So God was alone walking through, but he's not alone. The smoking fire pot and a flaming torch represent God and no other than the Holy Spirit of God. And as we mentioned earlier, the word of the Lord came to do, to talk, communicate, to converse, and to get this document, to get this agreement, to get this, um, this uh, the promise uh, contract, you know, what we call, um, I forgot this term, you know, yeah. notary, holy, divine notary, stamp him. It's not small. It's life and death. But only God alone was doing this. Contract of two party required two people to sign, but God alone signed in this. Yet this is, as I mentioned, as gory, uh, bloody, and, and so all that. The flaming fire, the flaming torch, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy God, walk through this and touch. That's a smart point, but nevertheless, it's there. But the punchline here is in verse 18. On that day, that moment, that event, the Lord, the Yudhei made a covenant with Abram. He made a covenant. God made a covenant with the serious God keep his promise with Abraham and with all the earth. But who did he make the covenant with? Abraham, the father of faith and the father of the Jews. Salvation, the gospel, the power of God to save life to all who, to all who believe to the Jew first, and then the Gentile. This is God designed, this is God promise. And it's beautiful and powerful. I would bow to this all day long, no question mark. Who am I? Who am I? What, what, is, what, what good is in me at all that God should look upon, said God owe me anything? No, I'm glad God even cared to look toward all sin, including myself. God made a promise. God made a covenant on his own to save humankind through the Abraham offspring, the son of Abraham, the son of King David, no other than our Lord Jesus Christ himself. The promise, the covenants fulfilled in the life of Christ. As we saw last week, we were uh, offering him the worship of the communion, the remembrance of him. In Luke 22, we saw that Jesus as Luke 22, we were in passage 14 to 22. And this is verse 20. As Jesus, 19 and 20, Jesus broke the bread and represented his body and said, do take this to do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup after he had eaten, say, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant. Not new, the last one old, and this one new, it's different. New means to your fresh, to complete the polish, the completion, the accomplishment, the finish. It is finished. This is a new covenant. This is the covenant that is fulfilled in my blood. Isn't that wonderful? God promised. Or the triune promise. Triune God promise. God, the Father promise. Jesus complete. The Holy Spirit carry on the mission and the great commission throughout the world. And that is why God had to go through the Jews, the apostle, the Jerusalem church, and throughout the world as he promised, as he came in, in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8 as well. Everywhere. I would like to conclude this in this passage today. While we at the book of Luke a lot today, Acts and Luke. 
Let's read this passage one more time regarding the Great Commission, regarding the salvation, regarding Christ's suffer and resurrection, regarding the holy, high and holy season and holiday, regarding God's nature, God's promise, God's sovereign, God's sovereignty, God holy promise to himself, God fulfilling his promise because he's powerful. God does this because he's loving and gracious and kind and merciful to sinners, even unto us the Gentiles. Luke 24, 44 to 47, and I'm going to focus on 46 and 47. He said to them, Thus it is written, this is the Holy Scripture, Grafe, scripture, written, Bible, that Christ should suffer, should suffer to death, should die. But on the third day, rise from the dead. So that suffer is not just suffer, pneumonia or COVID, or shame, or humiliate. No, he suffered death. Shameful death, torturing death, unfair death, the death that he did not deserve. He knew no sin, but he took the punishment on our behalf, that kind of death, that kind of suffering. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. He is not a dead Messiah. He's not a dead Savior. He's not a dead God. Jesus Christ alive. He rose from the dead on the third day. And that is to forgive us for our rotten sin, sinful nature and sins. So that we can repent from our sin. We have the opportunity to repent. We have the opportunity to turn, to, to go to God for salvation. And to serve Him, to love Him, to worship Him. And to obey Him. And to carry the baton of salvation in the gospel of, about Jesus Christ to the end of the world. He said, and that repentance, verse 47, for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed, should be preached, should go out to all nations and make disciples and baptize them in the, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. That's this, the gospel. And teach them all things that Jesus have commanded them let, hand it down to us and us to others. Find teachable men and women, faithful people, who God have chosen, who believes in God, who believe in Jesus, who should receive the gospel. It's a power to save soul. And teach them to do the same thing to the end of the earth until he returns. To all nations proclaiming Proclaim in his name. We are to proclaim the gospel, the suffering, the, resurrec the resurrection of Christ to for, for the forgiveness of sin in Jesus' name. To whom? To all nation. To all nation. To all nation. To the end of the earth, beginning from Jerusalem, where God planned and he put his jewel there. Jerusalem, where the church starts, near Calvary, where the Lamb was sacrificed, and rose again on the third day. And we have to proclaim that from Jerusalem all the way to the end of the earth. Another footnote. Do we go back to Jerusalem and do that? No, don't worry about that. It's already done. Our job is to continue to all nations to the end of the earth until we return. Just be faithful to that. Don't be extras. Um, don't be don't be um, overly uh, 
trying to be all the way to Jerusalem. We don't need that. Just do our part. Just enough. Just fulfill our part. To preach the gospel to our nation. We don't need to be overachieved to go back to Jerusalem. The apostles already did it. The Jews already did it. And now the Gentile. However, if you are called to go back to preach the gospel to the Jews because there's a mission, the gospel for the Jews, by all means, go ahead and do that. But the commission from God, this, path, this, is, this plan from the Jerusalem out is in place. It's in place. Now that we receive the gospel, receive Christ, and receive the Holy Spirit, and receive salvation, we confess our sin, we worship our God, we thank God, we are to obey Him. We are to obey Him. This bring glory to Him. And we are to obey Him, to love Him, by loving one another, the church. And to obey Him, to worship Him, more than love our church is to care for the lost soul, which is to proclaim the gospel. So, the Jew first and the Gentile, now that we are the Gentile, receive the Holy Spirit and the gospel, let us go in His grace, Pastor David said, and do fulfill the Great Commission. May God be glorified. May God be honored. May God forgive me if I think that I said it's not true, it's not right, it's not in His plan. God probably say, ah, ah, no, that's not what, <laughs> and may God forgive me, I sincerely mean that. And if I mislead you or anyone regarding the, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit to the Jew versus the Gentile, I don't think I missed that. But if I miss, I'm... I'm confident that I can make mistake. Uh, may God forgive me. And and if you see that part that I said wrong, forgive me and correct me. I'm more than glad to receive correction as long as I can grow to honor God, grow to serve Him, grow to serve you better. I am here for it. But ultimately, I am so grateful to God for his grace and salvation, forgiveness to my own rotten soul, sinful nature alone. Alone. Even if I don't didn't get to do anything to serve God in a sense of serving him, preaching the word or serving in the church, I am absolutely grateful and content because I didn't I don't even deserve that. Therefore Glory be to God. I would like to stop at this moment to end my sermon at this point and invite Pastor David to conclude our service in the blessing, blessing the name of the Lord and blessing the church. Thank you, Pastor Adam. Let's close now and ask the Lord to help us as we as his children, we want to live out our lives um, according to the word of God, uh, because by it, we know that we have been instructed from, from God himself. And so let's ask the Lord to bless this uh, to our hearts as we go from here. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for promises made to mankind to Abraham, plans that were formed even from before the creation of the world. But Lord, your promise that you would, through Abraham, bring about a seed who would be the one through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And you sent that seed, your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and and that you indeed did purpose for the gospel to go from Jerusalem, where Christ died and ascended, and to expand the gospel reach beyond our greatest imaginings, the apostles' greatest imaginings, Lord, and Lord, that you testify to that grace, to that mission, by giving your spirit, 
not only to those apostles, not only to those Jews that began in Jerusalem, but to those believers in Samaria, to the Gentile Samarias, and to those, all of those who would place their faith in Jesus Christ, that there would be not uh, any that would belong to Christ who do not have your spirit in us. We all have the same spirit, not in part, not in increments, but Lord, the fullness of your spirit dwelling in us. Oh, we thank you for that, Lord, because it is our, our divinely given joy and mission to bring about uh, the Great Commission, Lord. And we know that this is something that is empowered by you, by your spirit, Lord. So we thank you that you have given us your spirit, Lord, so that we can continue on the mission that you began in your apostles to bring the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so, Lord, as we uh, go from here, Lord, we ask that you would use us, that you would take your abiding word, Lord, that you would refresh us as we remember your word, that you'd strengthen us as we remember the power that you give us by your spirit, that you would humble us and convict us, Lord, that we would not grieve your spirit. Lord, help us now as we bring your mission, your gospel to the ends of the earth so that we can in turn, turn around and give you all the glory, throw down our crowns at your feet and say, praise you, O Lord, for your wonderful works, for your wonderful grace in our lives. And so Lord, we ask that you would do this for the honor of your name. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Here we go in the power of God's spirit in each one of us to fulfill his great commission.